Thanks for joining us for this author interview. I'm Tim Hill with Tan Books. Happy to be joined by the author of the new book, How the Eucharist Can Save Civilization, Dr. Jared Stout. Really appreciate you being here. Really excited to talk about this. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start with a prayer? Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we adore you in the most blessed sacrament. Uh, and we ask that this book may give you glory and honor, that you would restore our lives through the gift of the Eucharist, and that you would also restore our civilization. We entrust all these things to you through your most holy name. Amen. In the name amen. of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Dr. Stout. I, I got to see a great moment that I have very rarely ever seen. Maybe one of the best parts about this job, you just saw the book for the first time here a few minutes right. ago. How, right. how does it feel putting all, knowing all of that work, now it's in your hand? Well, you know, it's, it's redeeming, actually, because my first book was about beer. And I felt a little guilty about that. Here I am, a theologian, <laughs> and uh, I'm devoting my talents to writing about beer. And, and so I said, you know, Lord, I'm going to write a book about the Eucharist. And so this was really years uh, in the making, um, and, and it feels great to actually see the book. And, and now I hope that uh, rather than drawing people to beer, I can draw people to our Lord. That's a, a fantastic uh, background, and now evolution, <laughs> maybe, yeah, and right? all encompassing. Uh, the, the foreword of this book by Joseph Pierce asks a question I wasn't expecting. Is civilization worth saving? Mm -hmm. I, to me, that's a fascinating question to consider to, to start this book. And I guess we could ask another question, is our civilization worth saving? And if we look at the big picture, right, you know, already in Acts of the Apostles, the, the early disciples were accused of turning the world upside down, threatening Greco-Roman civilization. And eventually, of course, Christians did convert the Roman Empire, and then it collapsed. And so the Greco-Roman world, you know, was not saved in that sense, but it was redeemed, and, and we have a new civilization growing up around the monasteries and developing into the great culture of Christendom. And for the last 500 years, the, the culture created by Christendom has been in turmoil, um, and it's been slowly decaying from within. But a lot of the principles that people adhere to in our culture are originally based on the Christian faith, uh, the dignity of the individual. That is something that was really achieved uh, by Christian civilization to say that everyone, no matter what, has dignity as being made in the image of God. Um, and freedom. You know, where does this deep desire uh, for freedom come from? Uh, it really is the fact that God has given us this freedom to be able to direct ourselves towards our end, which is ultimately happiness in Him, but the other side of freedom is that you can pursue other things. And so I, I would say that our civilization is running on fumes, these fumes from the past. Um, and there may be some things that need to actually collapse before they can be saved and, and rebuilt. And so we're, we're seeing that, that I think the decline of our civilization will continue. But, you know, looking at that big picture, the church has saved civilization in the past and can save it again. Mm, so many things that apply to today, and then uh, I love how you bring it to an optimistic uh, bent at the end there that, uh, yeah, it can be saved. Civilization can be saved by the Eucharist. You mentioned your first book was on beer, which I, I'm fascinated by, and I'm sure we'll talk plenty about, uh, maybe not necessarily in this conversation, and then the Eucharist. Uh, to me, it represents so much of what Catholicism is. Is, is that why it was um, maybe not easy, but you use it as the central focal point here? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there is a connection to the beer option, right? Because the, the beer option was a book saying that, you know, everything that is good in human culture can be directed towards God, and that includes even our eating and drinking. And so the, the moving uh, from writing about beer to the Eucharist, the, you know, actually has a connection. And that is, this is now our sacred eating and drinking um, of our Lord's body and blood. And culture really is this organization of how we live, and it's all-encompassing. And so at the heart of a Christian civilization is eating and drinking, a supernatural eating and drinking, but it sanctifies everything else even things like how you drink beer, 
uh, how you relate to other people, how you shape your work. Um, everything is shaped by this inner core of our communion with God. So knowing that, uh, it, it's a really all-encompassing look. Now, now it comes to okay, organizing it from a book standpoint and and getting your your message out there. How did that process work in, in your mind? Well, as we see in the introduction, you know, I, I used the definition of the Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian life to be the organizing principle of the book. So the source of the Christian life, uh, it's looking at salvation history. Um, how God created us to actually share in his own dominion over creation and to cultivate things because bread and wine are not actually natural goods. They're cultivated goods. Um, and then we see how they're taking, taken up within the life and the worship of the people of Israel, perfected by Jesus, and then transmitted down to us through the church. So that's the source um, that you have what we really see throughout salvation history. The summit is our encounter with the Eucharistic Christ and the Mass. And so how the Mass really is the most important thing that we could ever do in our lives, you know, this meeting uh, with Christ himself. And so I look in, in that section on the summit of what we need to do to prepare for that, how we follow up from that, and even what we need to do to really enter more deeply into that encounter. Um, so the source, the summit, and the final section is the Christian life. That is, the Eucharist is not simply something to be believed, it's something to be lived. And so really that, that follow up from the Mass is, is the whole last section. Um, to say that our lives should be Eucharistic, um, how we direct our time, our relationships, even the places uh, where we live and, and where we worship, that all of this comes into it so that we can then sanctify the world. That, that the Eucharist is a mission we're sent out um, from Mass to, to live according to our faith, but also to sanctify the world, and in a way to recover it, right? Because if we go back to the source, right, God made the world good, and he gave us a mission within it, but we're fallen. And so, in a way, the Eucharist is a rescue mission to really give us the antidote from within, but it requires us to make use of that and to go out into the world and to really heal the world uh, and to shape and direct it towards God. Rescue mission. I, lo I love how you put it that way. It almost makes this an adventure yeah, <laughs> novel right? in a lot of ways, for sure. <laughs> uh, so if you don't mind, why don't we just dive right in here? Um, you mentioned how you set it up, the source and summit of the Christian life, and encountering Jesus in the Eucharist is one of the first ways that you introduce things about the two disciples talking with a stranger and then realizing that it's Jesus on the, the day of his resurrection. And what's amazing about you know, the, this journey to Emmaus is that they don't realize it's Jesus until the breaking of the bread. That's the key aspect here, is that, you know, I hear people say, wouldn't it have been great to be one of the disciples and to be with Jesus in the flesh? And he wants to be in the flesh with us as well, but he reveals his presence to us in the breaking of the bread. So what happens to the two disciples journeying to Emmaus is how Jesus actually reveals himself to us as well. And I give my own personal example. You know, I grew up a, uh, a non-practicing Catholic, uh, and I was actually expelled from the public schools in seventh grade. I never even had detention, but I brought in my Boy Scout knife to school, and they had zero tolerance. Wow. And so my mom went around to other schools. She even went to the Jewish Academy before she went to the Catholic school. So the Catholic school was like last on the list. And of course, that was the only school that would take me in and kind of give me another chance, you know, because everyone else was like, a weapon? No, forget about it. And it was a few weeks into the Catholic school, and the pastor invited me to come to daily Mass. Now, I wasn't going to Sunday Mass, 13 years old. Um, and the priest said, you know, we took a, a chance on you, and so will you do me a favor? Yes, Father, anything. Will you come and serve Mass on the anniversary day of my ordination? And my mom was like, absolutely, 6.15 in the morning, no problem, you know? Uh, and so that morning, I had a Eucharistic encounter with the Lord. I, I really came to know him 
for the first time in my life. Um, and I really felt him calling me to abide with him um, within the church, that, that really calling me to find my home, to find the, the meaning of my life with him and the church. And now here we are a few years later. Yeah, a few, a few, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, incredible personal experience, and that uh, leads you to the next section in your book, the Eucharist in the plan of life. Obviously, your plan significantly changed there. Yes, and and the the plan of life is really that that God has designed the whole sacramental system of the church to shape our entire lives, and so of course in baptism we're reborn. Um, and the, the next sacrament, according to the church's original kind of plan of the sacramental life, is confirmation. And so confirmation is a strengthening of the graces given to us in baptism that are ordered towards the completion of our initiation with the Eucharist. And so the Eucharist is the food and drink that is meant to sustain us as we grow into the full stature of Christ. And so how do we grow in, into Christ? By consuming Christ himself. Um, and then, of course, we have the sacraments of healing that restore us uh, as we are wounded and fall um, in the course of our lives, and, and also to prepare us for death, and then the, the sacraments of, of mission. But the Eucharist is at the heart of the reception of all of the sacraments. I mean, baptism precedes it, but it, it's completed this initiation is completed with receiving the Eucharist, um, and then the sacraments of healing are ordered towards repairing communion, and so they're completed by receiving the Lord, and then even the sacraments of mission, right? You think of uh, holy orders. The heart of that is the celebration of the Mass, and also in marriage, you think of, of the two becoming one flesh. I mean, that is a Eucharistic image as well, because the Lord becomes one flesh with us. And in Ephesians 5, uh, Paul says this is a great mystery, Christ's love of the church, right? And, and so he's talking about marriage. Marriage is a great mystery, and by this I mean Christ and the church. Um, and so the, the Eucharist is Christ giving of his own flesh for the life of the bride, um, and there is a way in which Christian matrimony becomes Eucharistic in that same sense uh, of the husband giving his own flesh to the bride in this kind of fruitful union. We'll definitely talk more about that later. I know you talk about that a little later in your book. wanted to uh, read a quote. The Eucharist stands as the greatest of the seven sacraments because it, is, it not only communicates God's grace, but makes the Son of God truly present to us in tangible fashion. And the word Eucharist means thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Yes, and so, you know, all of the sacraments are ordered towards our union with God, but God himself becomes sacramentally, tangibly present to us in the Eucharist. Um, and so all of the other sacraments are ordered towards it, um, and the, the Eucharist shapes our lives completely. Because when you think of our eternal vocation, what is it? Is perfect communion with God. And so our eternal happiness begins even now through the Eucharist. So yes, it is the greatest of the sacraments. As a, a cradle Catholic, uh, I've never thought about taking that next step. Then totally understand what you're saying about the sacraments. Got that. Then you go to how the Eucharist shapes culture. In my mind, I never made that connection. Your quote is, culture is a fundamental necessity for human life. How does the, the Eucharist play into that? Mm -hmm. So I, I define culture simply as a way of life that as human beings, you know, it's not sufficient that we're just kind of born and just go off and do our thing like squirrels, right? You know, so a squirrel's born, doesn't have to go to squirrel school, just knows how to be a squirrel and does squirrel things, right? Um, whereas we as human beings, we're initiated into a whole way of living, which is a human culture. So you're kind of born with human nature, but you're born into a particular culture. And that shapes how you live, how you think, how you relate to other people, your aspirations, everything. Um, and so we need culture. That is, we need to live in communion with other people. And if we think of culture as a kind of communion, we can see how the Eucharist is really the heart of that. Um, that God doesn't want us to be Christians and then to have a whole separate culture alongside of that. That's actually secular, right? If you are a believing Christian, you go to Mass every Sunday, 
Um, but then you live just a normal life apart from God, that is secularism. And so we need to live an integrated way of life. And so God needs to be at the center of everything that we do. And so the Eucharist actually gives life to culture. That is, in our reception of the Eucharist, we become one with Christ, and so Christ shapes how we think, how we live, all of our actions, all of our relationships. And so we build up a whole way of life flowing from the Eucharist as Catholics. Your quote in the book, Christian culture has become too thin, and Catholics urgently need to begin living their faith more robustly than ever before. Mm -hmm. Just to further your point there, it, uh, exactly what you were saying, and one other quote I wanted to pull out, and you used the example of Benedictine monks entering monasteries to seek God after the collapse of the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. uh, laying the foundation for a whole new civilization built around that search. The quote, Christians create culture not by making culture the goal, but by putting God first in life. Yeah, and I, th I think that's it, right? God first and everything else will fall into place. I love the, the line from the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom and everything else will be added uh, onto you. John Paul II said that the crisis of faith is not just about faith, but it's also about culture. Uh, because how can you say that you believe something if you live in a way that's contradictory to what you say you believe? Um, and so John Paul said that faith has to become a culture because it has to be lived out. It has to be, right? Otherwise, our faith is, is not genuine faith. It's the difference between words and actions or word being in action. Salvation remains our first priority, you write, and only through union with Christ will our work have effect in changing the world. This is in your section subtitled, Can the Eucharist Save Civilization? To me, that answer is a resounding <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it's not going to save civilization by, you know, our Lord kind of coming out and saying, all right, here's the action plan to save civilization. First, you need to elect this political party. <laughs> then you need to pass these laws. Uh, and, of course, we need to come up with those kinds of things, right? But what do we need first? The biggest problem facing the world today is that we are lacking God. I mean, God is the ultimate answer. And I think sometimes we can say, yeah, yeah, I, I know, but, but really the election that's coming up or, or the tax laws or, you know, fixing education. And we are called to address all of these problems, but we will not be able to do it unless we are first rooted in God and communion with God and building up the foundation of Christian culture as a way of life that flows from our faith. That is actually what will enable us to save civilization. And we can look back to history, the Benedictine monks, right? They rebuilt Western civilization after the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West by seeking God above all else. Um, and because they put God first, then economics and education, even healthcare, because that flowed from the monasteries, all of that flowed out of their seeking God first. And I think that's an important model for us today. Well, we can definitely overcomplicate things. We can get in our own way so much. If you have a very clear goal like that, I think that is something we can all take strength from and clarity from in our everyday lives. Uh, you mentioned a Eucharistic revival in your next section in the book, mm -hmm. immersed in that source and summit of the Christian life. Here's the quote, the church expresses the supreme importance of the Eucharist by calling it the source and summit of the Christian life. What does that mean to you here? Yeah, you know, Pope Benedict said that just like we see the eclipse of God in the world, we can actually also have an eclipse of God in the church. That is, we can be so focused on doing things for God or, you know, just like you can be so caught up in, in politics and economics in, in society— well, there's politics and economic concerns within the church. And so when we go to church, is this clearly focused on God? You know, are, are we clearly focused on worshiping him, being drawn out of ourselves? Um, is our, our parish life something that truly teaches us how to live uh, on, a, on a daily basis? That's how I think about the Eucharistic revival, right? That's, that's a three-year revival that was launched by the, the U.S. bishops in the summer of 2022. 
All right, so we're in the midst of this three-year revival right now. Um, and I really do think that the revival will be successful not only by deepening our faith in Christ's Eucharistic presence, which, of course, is the heart of the revival, but by living it out robustly at the parish and you know through our, our Sunday worship, but then having that inform the rest of our lives. In my mind, that will be a successful revival. Culminates, I guess, in 2024 in Indianapolis, and mm -hmm. uh, I feel like the the church is trying to walk us through through it. I feel like your book is is doing that as well. Did you get that feeling as you were writing this and, and researching? Yeah, I, I think it's a providential connection because, of course, as I was writing the book, I didn't know that there would be a Eucharistic revival. But in in the Lord's providence, He has the book coming out in the middle of of the revival. And I think it, it can be a great resource for parishes um, as we're thinking, okay, what does the revival really mean? Um, and, I, and I give a lot of concrete ideas, especially in, in that final section about living out the revival, just for the average Catholics. The middle section would be more, how can we reinvigorate the spirituality of the Mass? So I, I think that on that level, the book can really help us to refocus uh, with the Eucharistic spirituality and then the third section can really help us to enter more deeply into a Eucharistic life uh, within the home. Well, let's go to part one, if you're ready for it, the source, Absolutely. the foundations of Christian culture. Uh, you start with historian Christopher Dawson identifying the four major components of, of culture there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dawson is one of my favorite historians because he traced all of human history through the lens of the relationship of religion and culture. And so I defined culture simply as a way of life. I've been influenced by Dawson, even in that definition. Uh, but he says that culture is a particular group of people coming together in a particular place uh, with particular practices, but all shaped fundamentally by what these people believe, uh, because that ultimately will give a vision for uh, what, what this group of people actually is aspiring to, to accomplish together, uh, what they value. Um, and so religion is the heart of culture. And of course, today we're really missing that heart. But the first section of the book is organized around those principles. So I actually begin with the second one. So uh, being rooted in nature itself. And Dawson gives the example of, you think of the difference between living in Amazonia and the Arctic, right? You know, you think of the Eskimos up there, right? I mean, culture will be fundamentally different based on that starting point of our contact with nature. And so I look at God's creation. That's the starting point that he's given us um, through which we can build culture. And in particular, of course, as we're talking about the Eucharist, that is the development of the necessities of life, bread and wine, and, and really, I mean, bread and wine are so fundamental to the beginnings of human civilization that we could even just say food and drink. You know, think that civilization emerged in, in Mesopotamia and the surrounding areas, you know, roughly eight to 9,000 years ago with the domestication of grains. Um, and so you have bread and beer, uh, both uh, co coming out of that time period, and wine as well. I mean, so this is really the very beginnings of human civilization. Um, and it's not simply, okay, about food and drink. Like, yes, we, we developed bread and now we can sustain ourselves. Some of the earliest archaeological sites that we've discovered are actually religious sites. And there actually was offerings of, of food and, and of beer and of wine at these original sites. And so we see... That at the beginnings of human civilization, you have cultivation and cult that are drawn together. And so I actually like to, to look at these things together, cult, culture, cultivation. Cult just being religion and, and worship, uh, culture uh, being this, this way of life, and, but cultivation being, of course, the work that is needed to sustain uh, a people. So cult, cultivation, culture, kind of all uh, coming together. And so food and, and drink were always festive uh, in the ancient world. So not simply secular, right? You know, so uh, Christians should be opposed to any kind of secularism that simply looks at any aspect of life as not having a religious sig signification. Everything in human culture is ultimately religious uh, 
in the sense that it is ordered towards God. And even the ancient peoples realized this. So food and drink were religious and festive in nature, and that's why they had uh, different rituals and celebrations that marked um, the, the year, the cycles of agriculture. And so there would be large um, you know, meals uh, to, to celebrate significant days, and then, of course, sacrifice, uh, which we see happening at the very beginning of thanking God um, for the gift of food and drink, which, of course, are a great cooperation between God's creation and the work of our hands. In your section, Cult, Culture, and Cultivation, this quote stands out to me. The Second Vatican Council affirms that man comes to a true and full humanity only through culture, through the cultivation of the goods and values of nature. And you you, meant back, you went back to the beginning. I'm going to go back even further from the beginning after that because your next section in the book is how food was in the fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to say something about that quote from Vatican II first um, is that our cultivation is part of being made in the image of God because God is the creator, but he has instilled within us a desire to be creative, and that is really an extension of God's work of creation and a cooperation with God, the fact that we can take grapes and make wine, right? So God made the grapes— but he inspired this kind of creativity within us to go farther and to try to perfect things. It's, it's like he left creation half finished and to say, okay, now you do the rest. And so we see that, you know, with the beginnings of civilization and even technology in the ancient sense of trying to perfect the, the work that God has entrusted to us. Now, in the story of the fall, we see that the gifts of creation Uh, contain a test within them. And so God has entrusted uh, creation to us, but he has said that we are not the ultimate masters and that we have to be obedient to him in how we use the gift of creation. And so he enabled us to eat the fruit of all the trees, but not the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so the fall actually happens through eating. And that's very significant when we're thinking about the Eucharist because our salvation will then come to us through eating. The Eucharist is a, is a fruit of the tree of the cross, but the fall is, is a fruit of a different tree, right? The tr- a tree that is good, what's wrong with the eating of the fruit of the knowledge, of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, is that we were trying to define for ourselves what is good and evil rather than receiving them from God. And so we have to receive creation as a gift and, and, and to always be in subordination to God and how we work. And that's very important for us today, right? Because there is a temptation even today to want to be the Lord, the master, the dominator of creation. And that is just simply a continuation of the fall. And so you mentioned you start at salvation history, start there, move to the Old Testament, um, Celebration and memory in the Old Testament is the subtitle to chapter 2. In this quote, in many ways, the Old Testament points to Jesus' establishment of the Eucharist that will bring about a new covenant for God's people, and that leads us to the covenant with the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. So just as we see in the beginnings of civilization, that food, drink, celebration, worship, sacrifice, that all of these things are bound up together. So Israel is a holy nation which is formed by God himself, and he is the king of the people of Israel. And so he created for them their rites of worship. And so what do we see in Israelite worship? Uh, uh, Basically, a giving back to God of the good things that he has entrusted to us. And so sacrifice is literally making something holy. That's what the word means. It's etymology. Um, But it's giving up something that is good giving it to God to show that he is the one who is supreme. Now, Israelite worship was also an act of memory because the sacrifices of Israel were also evocative of the Exodus, the fact that God liberated Israel from slavery in Egypt, brought them into the promised land. And so when we think of of the great festivals, so of course the Passover is the best example of that, this annual commemoration of the liberation from Egypt. 
Um, but even if you, you could also look at the Feast of Booths, of course, this commemoration of the time in the wilderness, that time of Israel's stubbornness and, and having to learn to trust God. But there was even a whole daily and weekly cycle of sacrifice in which both bread and wine were offered. You had cereal offerings, that's grain offerings, and you had a libation of wine poured out to God every day. And even within uh, the tent of the meeting and then, and then the temple, right? So you had the tabernacle and then the temple, uh, they actually had an altar of the presence, um, and where you had the showbread, the, this bread and wine that were placed out uh, in front of the Holy of Holies um, to, to be an image of God's presence. And of course, when we think about the Eucharist, right, this is a very clear foreshadowing of what would happen in the gift of Jesus' uh, body and blood of his presence. And the, the showbread could actually be translated as the bread of the face, Right? And so Jesus will reveal himself to us in the bread and wine, which becomes his body and blood. Uh, but that is foreshadowed both in the bread and wine of the Passover and then the daily offerings and this showbread, uh, which was presented to the Lord in Israelite worship. And you mentioned before the importance of keeping God first. For us today, for those in Israel in the Old Testament, this quote jumped out at me, God formed a distinct culture in Israel one guided by a unique form of worship. Worship should always remain the priority over work, political success, and even life itself. Israel continued to struggle with this reality, mm -hmm. however. Yeah, and you can look at the life of Israel as a pedagogy, as a teaching. God was trying to teach them how to be in relationship with him. And worship was the heart of that. If we talk about putting God first, right? Sacrifice is an image of God being first over every other good thing. Uh, and so this is something that we've carried into the life of the church, that our daily sacrifice is the one sacrifice of Christ. And it shows us, just as Jesus said, not my will, but your will. The, the ultimate sacrifice is ourselves. And that's what Israel had to learn, that the, the worship, the sacrifice of animals or the, or the grain offering or the libation of the wine, it's all meant to say, I am giving myself to God through this worship. And Jesus, this is getting into the next chapter a bit, but, but Jesus embodied that most fully for us on the cross, this giving of his own life to the Father. And we share in that offering when we go to Mass. So we move from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant with Jeremiah, fulfilling the prophecies of Jesus' birth, doing that. Um, the Incarnation, the abiding center of all things, is the title of chapter 3. And this quote go goes back to what you talked about before, the rescue mission, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus entered the world for a rescue mission, divinizing human life from within. Rather than seeking the meaning and purpose of our existence blindly by ourselves, the Word of God shone his light into our darkened world and sought us out. And mm -hmm. then you go to John's quote from chapter 1, the Word became flesh and he dwelt among us. Yes, and so Jesus is born in a manger, uh, in Bethlehem, the house of bread, right? So man a manger That's is... That's a quick one. I didn't know this until I read the book. So yeah. Bethlehem translates to the house of bread. House of bread. Incredible. And so he's, he's born in the house of bread in a manger, which is a place of eating. And so the incarnation itself, that is Jesus is taking on of human flesh, is Eucharistic in itself. He was born to be eaten. And the rescue mission is not simply restoring... Um, the Garden of Eden, right? He does actually something even much more than that. Because as you said, right, he divinizes us. That is, by eating the flesh of the Son of God, we become one with him. Uh, that we become Christ. We become sons in the Son to share in his own divine life. That's the goal of the incarnation. Um, and so in, in the Old Testament, there was a prohibition against drinking blood. Why? Because it says that the blood was the life of a being, and there was a respect for that, right? So we actually respect the animals that we eat. We drain their blood, um, and then, you know, they could be sacrificed or, or cooked or whatever, but there was a kind of respect. But then Jesus kind of breaks that taboo by saying, drink my blood. That's shocking. But if the blood of the, is the life of something, well, Jesus actually wants us to, 
not only to consume the life of his humanity, but actually his own divine life. That's the goal of the Eucharist. To me, it's only logical that something shocking would come from the Son of God, God himself, on earth as those back then were all taking it at the same time. It, it makes sense that it, it shouldn't be normal and every day. And uh, in taking on our flesh is a quote, the word established a bridge between God mm. and humanity, overcoming mm -hmm. the abyss that arose since the fall. Seeing Jesus as the bridge really hits home with me. I, I never heard it quite described in that way. And that was a scandal to the Jews. So drinking blood, eating flesh and drinking blood was a scandal to the Jews, as we see in John 6. But even being that bridge, the fact that a human being could be a bridge to God was also scandalous because part of what God was teaching the Israelites in the Old Testament is that he was wholly other, that, that he was supreme, that he was beyond the world, that he couldn't be reduced to, to an idol. Right? And, and that even you could not picture God, right? That the divine essence was beyond any description, any depiction, any reduction. But then Jesus, as Paul says, is the icon of God. And so it seems on the surface to contradict the lesson of the Old Testament by saying, oh, wait, but now here I am. You can see me, you can touch me, and you can even eat me. It's incredible, right? I mean, it is beyond our comprehension that the God who is wholly other, who is beyond us, now says, I will come within you. In a lot of ways, I feel like we're blessed to be 2,000 years removed from that as opposed to seeing that and trying to take that all in in real time. Oh, I can't imagine. Uh, we've, we've used the word shocking before. I think that is, I don't even know if there's a word for it. We should be shocked even today, right? So even though it's sure. not as raw as it was for the Jews, but if you really think about it, okay, the God who simply exists, has always existed, will always exist, no, no beginning, no end, no change, that God has become man. And not only has become man, but has humbled himself to taking the appearance of bread and wine so that I can eat him. You should be utterly amazed by that. And part of what I'm trying to overcome in the book is that we take that gift for granted. It becomes ordinary and routine because, oh, well, I, I receive the Eucharist every single Sunday. And so, yeah, it's just what we do as Catholics. No, right? It, it can't just be something that we do as Catholics. I mean, this has to be every time, you know, appreciating this great miracle and this great gift and never taking it for granted, trying to completely open up ourselves to receive it new every single time. And I love how you get into that a little later on in the book. Right now, back to Jesus and his, even his miracles, right? Feeding his people, mm -hmm. talking about the bread and the wine, Jesus' first miracle, right? You get into that. You point out, uh, I think there might be some reason that it, it was water to wine, the first, like mm -hmm. that can't be just a coincidence, right? It was a transubstantiation. Right, Transubstantiation is one of those great Catholic words that we're like, what the heck does that mean? I don't know. I'll just memorize it or something. But <laughs> it just means thing changingness is what it really means. right? And so we see already at Cana that Jesus is changing one thing to another. And it is Eucharistic because it's a symbol of his hour in which blood and water will flow forth from his side. Um, and so, yeah, we see that already, um, you know, really coming into the spotlight, you know, through that miracle. But when you look at the entire life of Jesus through the lens of the Eucharist, you see that he is constantly pointing us in that direction. So yes, the, the division of the loaves is Eucharistic because it says that he gave thanks and broke the bread. It's Eucharistic. Of course, the, the great discourse, John 6, I am the bread of life, you know, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. I, I mean, it is so very clear. And he, when does he say that? At the Passover. Even something like the Our Father. Um, Give us this day our daily bread. Well, it's epiousion in the Greek, and that actually means beyond being, is, is kind of a, a translation of it. And so you could say, you could translate the Our Father, Give us this day our super substantial bread. 
And Jerome didn't actually know how to translate it because it's a unique Greek word. It's nowhere else in the Bible. It's nowhere else in ancient literature, that epiousion. And so Jerome hedged his bets, and he translated it daily because it's kind of like beyond substantial. So give us kind of everything that we need. That's one translation. Um, but he translated it super substantial in the Latin in a different gospel, right, because it comes up in Matthew and Luke. So he translated differently in both gospels. And when we simply say, give us this day our daily bread, we miss the fact that that is actually a Eucharistic prayer. Give us this day our super substantial bread, that which goes beyond what we need, this kind of heavenly bread. And so that is meant to be our daily prayer, this prayer for Jesus as the bread of life. So there's so much there, once again, that we kind of take for granted and that we can miss. Only human nature, but just thinking about it, you're in your daily routine or you're in your super substantial routine, massively different connotation, or at least in my brain. Well, we can bring them together. Our daily routine as a Christian is meant to be super substantial, supernatural. And the Eucharist is what makes everything that we do, everything that we are, to be different and to be divine in Jesus Christ. You get back into what we talked about before, kind of how you introduced the book. Again, back to Emmaus, uh, at, actually at the, the day of the resurrection to uh, bring this story of Jesus kind of uh, to a, a almost, not a full close, but circle, certainly circle it back around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and what is the prayer that the two disciples kind of speak to Jesus, not even knowing it's a prayer? Remain with us, Lord. Um, you know, because evening draws near. Remain with us, Lord. And, you know, we can look back to even the Last Supper discourse in John's Gospel. Of course, the Last Supper is where Jesus instituted the Eucharist. Um, and he really shows us the, the meaning of the crucifixion, where he's giving his flesh and blood for us. As the new Passover lamb, the Passover lamb has to be consumed, right, within the Passover meal. So that's a crucial aspect of the Passover, is that the the, the flesh of the lamb needs to be eaten in order to enter into the covenant. And that's what we see happening. But the Last Supper discourse in John's gospel, um, starting, we see in chapter 15 and then following, um, is where I think Jesus gives us the, the, the deep meaning of the Eucharist, where he talks about abiding in him um, as being, you know, the, the, the branches of the vine, you know, all of that is deeply Eucharistic, but I think we can, we can overlook that as well. Um, and he says that the communion that I have with the Father, just as he and I are one, so you will be in me. That's my favorite line in all of the scripture. I mean, because he says that I and the Father are one. And he says, okay, so the, the unity that I have with the Father, that's the kind of unity that I want you to have with me. That's Eucharistic. That's becoming one flesh and also one spirit, because in the Last Supper discourse, that's when he says, I will give you the helper, the, the spirit, um, to be in you. And so we see that, you know, in our union with Christ, we're one flesh with him, but also one spirit with him. And so when we, when we look at what's happening at the journey to Emmaus, he's showing the disciples how this communion of being one flesh and one spirit with him will take place, and that is through the breaking of the bread. And now you transition from that to the church and taking that, right, almost to the next step or to just evolving it with the Eucharistic Church, Christ's body in the world, the the title of chapter four, with this quote, the Eucharist helps us to understand the reason the church's existence, for the church's existence, to cherish and guard Jesus's presence in the world and to foster communion around it for the salvation of souls. And Mm -hmm. that leads to the growth of a Eucharistic church. Yes. um, You know, the the church has failed in so many ways over 2,000 years, but the church has succeeded where it mattered most. Do this in memory of me. That is a kind of mission statement for the church. Do this in memory of me. The church is built around that communion. We have been faithful to that. We've been clinging to that. It's gotten us through in the last 2,000 years. Uh, And so part of what I do uh, in this chapter is to look at how the church has unpacked the meaning of that command. What does it mean to do this in memory of Jesus? What does that mean for the life of the church? Because the church is the body of Christ. Paul teaches that in 1 Corinthians, right? That we are members of the body, 
Um, and Paul says in First Corinthians, you know, do you not realize that when you are when you eat the bread, that you are entering into communion with the body of Christ, and that is what the church fundamentally is: that we are the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, so one in flesh, one in spirit with Christ. And we are meant to be a sacrament of Christ in the world. That happens through the Eucharist, being the flesh and blood of Christ in the world, drawing others into communion. Once again, the Eucharist is a mission. It's not passive. Well, we're just going to receive this from our Lord. Yes, of course. I mean, that constitutes us as the body of Christ. But it's also an active mission and that we're meant to continue to draw people into that. And that's part of, of why Paul was chastising the Corinthians. He said, because you come together to celebrate the Eucharist, and yet you have divisions amongst yourself. The Eucharist is meant to bring communion within the church, which is then meant to, to inspire us to go out and to draw others into that communion. And you, you mentioned now the development of theology, the idea of the Eucharist remaining the same, yet developing in the articulation of its details and implications, and there Mm -hmm. are a few major stages there. Yes, it's really incredible that we see testimony to the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist right away in the early church. Um, You know, you have the Didache, some people say maybe written even around the year 60, saying that you had to confess your sins before receiving the Eucharist. They had to do so in a worthy manner. Ignatius of Antioch around the year 100 talking about heretics, denying that the Eucharist is the flesh of Christ. You have um, even um, Justin Martyr in the mid-2nd century, so mid-100s, already talking about transubstantiation. Does he use that term? No, but, but he says that this is no longer ordinary bread because it becomes the body of Christ. Well, that's what transubstantiation is. This is not something medieval. It's there from the beginning. You have Cyril of Jerusalem really unpacking the meaning of of the Eucharist in his catechetical discourses. Um, We have St. Ambrose also talking about uh, transubstantiation, and he even does use language very similar to transubstantiation of one thing becoming another thing um, through the Lord's power. In the Middle Ages, we, we see an important development in theology, and that's where the term transubstantiation does become explicit, because there were certain people, Berenger of Tours is one of the greatest examples of this, of people saying, well, you know, the Eucharist is just symbolic. And so the church had to say, no, there is a substantial presence. What does that mean? Well, substance is what a thing truly is. And so to say that the Eucharist is not just a symbol of the Lord, it is his true presence, his body and blood are substantially made present within the Eucharist. And Thomas Aquinas becomes the great theologian that lays out even how that happens, right, through the, the, the sacramental grace um, of the church. Uh, and then, of course, you know, a lot of those controversies come up again within the Reformation. Many people, many of the so-called reformers, we would actually call them revolutionaries uh, as Catholics, that they also denied the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. There's a whole bunch of different variations of Protestant theology. Luther said that Jesus was present in the Eucharist, even though he denied transubstantiation. And so he said the bread is present and the body of Christ is present. Zwingli said it was just a symbol. Um, Calvin said it was a spiritual presence, you know, that accompanies the bread, right? So you have all these different variations. But all of the reformers, so-called, once again, denied that um, there is a transubstantiation that occurs, and they also denied the fact that the Mass is a sacrifice. But really, once again, a sacrifice is a sacred offering to God. It is not a new sacrifice. So a lot of the reformers said, well, Catholics are crucifying Christ again. But we believe that the Mass is the one sacrifice of Christ made present to us. It's a robust memory. Do this in memory of me, that we're drawn into the Last Supper, that we're drawn to the foot of the cross through the Mass. And that's what Jesus himself taught us when you simply look at the Gospels. It's a classic to me that uh, you have the so-called reformers and they say, no, no, that's not right. And then you ask them, well, what's right? And then oh, a ton of different opinions, yeah. right? It's, it's classic. I mean, we see it all, I see it all the time in my life today for sure. Now we go to Eucharistic holiness. 
going to specific saints to guide us. I think it's it's one of the great blessings of the Catholic Church, right? Not mm-hmm. only the Eucharist and how you just explained it to us, how we see it much differently than others, but then we're not on our own. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just us go figure it out or go read a book and then go do it. You have so many guides along the way, these saints at the top of that list. Yes, in the church, we are part of an unbroken communion of 2,000 years, and that communion is a communion of people. Like even now, we're the, part of the communion of saints, those on earth and purgatory and in heaven. We're, we're all together as one church. And so we are in communion with a lot of these great Eucharistic saints. I already mentioned a couple of them, you know, Ignatius of Antioch or Thomas Aquinas, these great teachers. But the saints are the ones who teach us what it means to live a Eucharistic life. They teach us how faith becomes flesh. Uh, within our lives. And so, you know, some of them, like St. Tarsisius, right, he was actually a martyr of the Eucharist. He, he died protecting the Eucharist from a mob who, who wanted to kind of uh, wrench it away from him as he was taking the Eucharist to those who were in prison. Um, we see some of the great saints uh, who are related to the liturgy, St. John Chrysostom with the Byzantine liturgy, or St. Gregory the Great, kind of solidifying um, the Latin Mass uh, for the West. Um, St. Francis of Assisi. A lot of people don't realize uh, that he had such a deep devotion to the liturgy. He said, poverty in all things except the liturgy, where he thought we should kind of lavish our devotion and attention um, to the Lord. And some of the saints that w- would be very familiar, you have St. Catherine of Siena, who just lived off of the Eucharist for seven years. St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, when she's teaching us about the Sacred Heart, right, that there is a deep connection Uh, between the devotion of the Sacred Heart on First Fridays and receiving the Eucharist. It is meant to be a Eucharistic devotion, um, actually. Um, St. Alphonsus Liguori, uh, creating many devotions uh, to the Eucharist. And some others that are not as well known, St. Peter Julian Amard. I I love his writings on the Eucharist. He was a great Eucharistic apostle, um, and people should really look him up. Or St. Anthony Mary Claret where the Eucharist remained within his heart, even in a tangible way. Um, St. Pius X, my confirmation saint, uh, actually, who really was encouraging us to receive the Eucharist more frequently if we were properly disposed and prepared. And then, of course, St. John Paul the Great, right, who he evangelized people throughout the world by gathering these huge crowds together to celebrate uh, the Eucharist throughout the world. And I, I failed to mention, I meant to, that's one of the first, that's the first scene in the book, I believe. Uh, it's kind of how you br- bring us in and uh, it, of our generation, let's say, of a certain age. That's certainly uh, one of my first memories, St. Pope John Paul II at the time, uh, being such a world leader, some of the largest gatherings in human history, right, where he is overseeing and then being kind of welcomed back to communist Poland at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in 1979, he goes back, you know, the eight days that changed the world, right, during his visit to Poland, um, and there was a very large mass in Warsaw, and there was just this chant during the mass for a very long time, and, you know, people wanted to break it up, and John Paul said no, but just the, the crowd at mass saying, we want God, we want God, and it comes back, right, because that is the one thing necessary, the one thing that we need is God present to us. And, of course, that happens most fully within the Mass itself. So now time to go to part two, the summit, the Eucharistic heart of the Christian life. And this quote jumps right out. The It's not an exaggeration to say that the Mass is Christian culture. It's source and summit giving rise to and perfection or perfecting the Christian life on earth. So now it's about the experience mm-hmm. with the Eucharist. And, and I think I might appreciate this section maybe more than any other because it is, okay, now you know about it, the source, right? But now, okay, now what about your experience living with it? Mm-hmm. And the temptation when talking about Christian culture is to focus on the outward elements of culture. But if we go back to Dawson's insight, religion is the heart of culture. And so if we're talking about Christian culture, the heart of Christian culture is the Mass. You cannot imagine Catholic life without the Mass. It is the heart of who we are, is the beating heart of the Christian life that that really, when you think of what the heart does, right, the blood flows to the rest of the body. That is absolutely true. 
when it comes to the Eucharist. From our encounter with the Lord and the Mass, we see just the blood of Christ pulsating throughout the rest of the body and giving life to it and animating everything else that we do. And for Catholics who go every Sunday and get them in a rut or a routine, I feel like this section gives, uh, I can certainly, I've been there, it gives us a, a bit of a blueprint for maybe how you can get out of that rut, how you mm-hmm. can maybe start to see it differently, just like you mentioned. Instead of going looking at things from the outside in, you see it more from the inside out. And that's the nature of a sacrament, right? What's a sacrament? An outward sign instituted by Christ to give us grace. Some people say an outward sign of an invisible and hidden reality. So you can go to Mass and you just kind of can look at it from the outside and maybe yawn a little bit. But this section is helping us to take off the blinders and to look more deeply what is really happening at the Mass. And what it is, is ultimately it's the prayer of Christ himself. He is the one praying in the Mass. And the spirituality of the Mass is joining in the prayer of Christ, worshiping the Father with him. And so this becomes our prayer. This becomes the heart of our own spiritual life, that we're drawn to the Father within and through Christ, and ultimately transformed into Christ through the Eucharist encounter with him. I love how you use Bishop Robert Barron's phrase, the Catholic thing. Yeah. That's what Mass is. Growing up in the South, not around a lot of Catholics, like, I I can hear other, my Protestant friends saying that, oh, that's the Catholic thing, the, the Mass. Yeah, and if somebody were to say, you know, as a Catholic, what would you say would be the number one thing that you would cling to, that you would say, this is who we are, this is what's most distinctive about us? Yeah, it's the Eucharist, it's the Mass, absolutely. That is who we are, and so what I'm trying to do in the book is to say, if the Mass is most important, how can we make it most important in our lives? How can we have that be the thing that shapes everything else that we do? And you call it uh, a foretaste of the eternal. Right, and that is kind of looking most deeply into the heart of the Mass, right? The Mass opens up a window into heaven, a window even into the life of God, because our communion with Christ, right? He's the Son of God. He's one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so when we receive the Eucharist, we literally are entering into heaven because we are communing with God, the Holy Trinity, at that moment. And so, yeah, we really need to look deeply and to pray deeply Um, so that we can really break through that barrier. We talked earlier about Christ being a bridge. He's a bridge for us at the Mass, right? And so when we pray at Mass, we can go across that bridge into heaven and into the very life of God. And you talk about the importance of ritual when it comes to the Mass. Quote, every culture which until now had religion at its center expressed its deepest convictions through religious ritual, and the ritual of the Mass goes all the way back to the Acts of the Apostles. And and we're very individualistic, right? So we want to say, well, my spirituality is about me, right? You know, And, and part of the sacramental ritual is we say, no, it's about Jesus, right? And so our ritual at the Mass is... Um, basically entering into the action of Christ, which was established all the way at the Last Supper itself, um, and of course enacted on the cross. And what do we see in Acts of the Apostles already? Right, They were breaking bread in homes. Um, They were abiding by the, the teaching of the apostles. They were serving the poor. All of this is an integrated Catholic culture right there at the very beginning with the Eucharist at the center. I love how you you end your chapter five here, talking about the key elements of the ritual of the Mass can be traced back to the earliest celebrations, and it takes us right through Mass, right? Starting with the sign of the cross with the holy water and going all the way through. And Justin Martyr was the one who gave us that first description, mid-second century. So the Mass has not changed in its essential outline since then. Um, and the Mass itself is meant to be a journey, so that's what I kind of go through. And, I and actually, it. I start before the Holy Water, right? Walking up the steps and going right. through the door. It's like you're entering into this gateway into, into the supernatural life once you even go into the church. The Holy Water uh, evokes our own baptism. Um, and then, you know, when we go through the way that the Mass itself is structured, right? You have introductory rites, which are meant to kind of lead you, prepare you for the heart of the Mass. You receive God's Word, His revelation, which centers us on Him. Uh, and then, of course, the Eucharistic prayer, which is the very center of the Mass, where we're praying with Christ. 
um, and then, of course, receiving him, um, our communion. But then we are then kind of blessed and sent out into the world, right? So the, the Mass itself is a whole journey. And I, I picture myself, my family, <laughs> my, my parish as you go through it in the book, and it really helps me to understand, to, to try to implement the way of your thinking into my life. So I, I appreciate that part of the book specifically. Thank you for that. Now, now you're talking about Christ's sacrifice in, in praying the Mass, the union with that sacrifice, which I think from a, a, a day-to-day realistic perspective can be, I think, sometimes the toughest thing mm-hmm. for me personally to, to attach to if I'm not in the right mindset or um, without being able to look at it, maybe how you walk us through it here. And it takes spiritual effort, right, to say, what does it mean to actively participate? Well, from the outside, it looks like you stand, you sit, you kneel, you make gestures. Just do what you know, everybody else and, does, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right, it's, and so those gestures and movements are meant to lead us into the prayer of Christ. But active participation ultimately is something that happens within us because we are attentive to what's actually happening at Mass, the prayer and the sacrifice of Christ. And we are making that our own. And it helps to actually, to pray that, to make an actual intention. And so I give like examples in the book of of actual prayers that you can say, you know, that I am offering this sacrifice to the Father with Christ. I am doing it for these intentions, right? To, To honor God, to make reparation for sin, to obtain grace for myself and, and for other people. So that we come to Mass with these particular intentions that help us to be more attentive to the spirituality of the Mass itself. It's almost like a, a, a hack, I guess, would be the current <laughs> buzzword for it, right? A hack to, because I don't know about you, but when I'm in Mass, sometimes I will feel myself almost pulling out to to not being, not experiencing it how I should if I'm not keeping all of that um, on the forefront or in the right. forefront and being a part of it. That active participation, like you're talking about, those prayers, I feel like, get you right back in. Yes, it's very, I find it very helpful. So prayer before Mass, and then there's prayers before communion, prayers after communion, uh, prayers after Mass. They, they, They kind of guide us through the dispositions that we need to really bear the most fruit uh, during the Mass in our prayer. And so, you know, once again, you can just kind of show up and go through the motions, but um, really taking some extra time for prayer before Mass, after Mass, making a good communion, these things really uh, enrich our spirituality and, and how we pray the Mass. And while these are things that we can do, that is kind of about us make, getting the most out of the Mass. I, I, the paradox of, of this line is fascinating to me and really hits home, too. The Mass is not about what I can get out of it, but what I offer to God in worship. That's right. And because it is about Jesus, right? So the, thankfully, when I go to Mass, it's not just about my own efforts, because what could I really do? to make up for my own sins and to obtain grace. It's Jesus who does that. But what's beautiful is that Jesus invites us to cooperate with him. He actually wants us to make his actions our actions and our actions to become his actions. That's what communion is about, right? There's an interpenetration, a cooperation between us and Christ in the actions of the Mass. It brings me back to that bridge that you talked about earlier, Mm -hmm. the bridge of... Jesus just being born to begin with, and then in the Mass specifically, that he's there (laughs) taking us to the Eucharist and and that bridge. He's the great high priest, but uh, we participate in his priesthood through our prayers at the Mass. You mentioned those specific prayers that you can say before, during, after. Any one that pops out to you, a, a favorite prayer? Yeah, absolutely. And You know, something that's helpful, I think, in the book is that I include a lot of these in the back, so you'll be able to to reference them. Um, But the the prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas before and after communion, those are really go-to prayers for me. uh, Because Aquinas says, you know, Lord, like I'm coming before you like a beggar. You know, I'm sick, I'm wounded, I'm dirty, and, and I need you to really supply you know, the things that, that heal me and that, that clean me um, and, that, and that really enrich me 
um, through my encounter with you at the Mass. So, yes, I, I love the prayers of St. Thomas Aquinas. Oh, that imagery of humility, mm -hmm. right? As it, that takes you right there, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. oh, impressive. Uh, uh, that's good stuff. Um, fasting and confession, you mentioned uh, in the practice of the Eucharist, how important both of those things are. Well, the Church requires us to fast before receiving communion. Now, um, before the 1950s, that was from midnight, the night mm -hmm. before, all the way until you receive communion. Pius XII made it three hours, and then Paul VI made it one hour before mm -hmm. communion. But that's something we should really think about, right? That the Church says there needs to be a break with normal eating and drinking um, so that you can then approach this supernatural eating and drinking um, in a different way. Um, and of course, the church asks us to to even have Friday to be a day of penance. Abstinence from meat is the default penance throughout the entire world for Catholics. Um, and so that's also a different way of eating. I'm, I'm taking a step back from my normal patterns so that Friday can be a preparation day for Sunday um, and, and for that eating. Now, confession is even more important, right? So I mentioned 1 Corinthians earlier about what Paul says to the community there. And, you know, he says that if you approach the body without discernment, you bring condemnation upon yourself. Um, and so how do we really do this? And Paul, Paul talks about, you know, even um, being forgiven of our sins, right, in, in that context. And so if we approach the Eucharist in mortal sin, we are committing the mortal sin of sacrilege. And so Catholics have to confess their sins at least once a year. So if you're not doing that, I mean, please do that, right? That's, that is the bare minimum that we need to do to prepare for receiving the Eucharist worthily. And, and that unless there's a grave reason, right, we need to attend Mass every single Sunday. And is, is that why the requirement is just for the Eucharist for once a year? Right. So, With confession. Um, so the tradition is that you would, go, you would go to confession during Lent and then receive the, the Eucharist during Easter, so that would be your, your Easter communion. I mean, in the Middle Ages, Catholics received the Eucharist at Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost, only three times a year, unless you were like religious or a particularly devout layperson and you had permission from your spiritual director to receive more frequently. And that made receiving the Eucharist a, a big deal, right? It was only three times a year. But I think even if we are weekly communicants, we need to make receiving the Eucharist a big deal. We need preparation. And if you receive the Eucharist regularly, you need to go to confession regularly because the two sacraments go together um, in the church's life. Yeah, it's fascinating. I didn't realize the history of that. And I think it's easy for us to get caught up. And if it's just a weekly occurrence, human nature you know, takes over. Maybe it's not as right. special if it were to be three times a year or once a year. Knowing that history is very helpful, mm -hmm. I think, in, in a shift in my mindset anyway, into making the Eucharist what it needs to be there. And I love how you took us through the Mass here in part two. Let's move to part three. The Christian Life, Building a Eucharistic Civilization. You named the book How the Eucharist Can Save Civilization, so this is really the crux of it in a lot of ways. That's right. So we, we looked at the source, the summit, and the Christian life, and once again, my thesis in the book is that the Eucharist is not something simply to be believed or even just to be celebrated. It is to be believed. It is to be celebrated, but it must be lived. And I, I would say that is what is most distinctive about the book, is that I'm trying to help Catholics to think, how can I live a more Eucharistic life? How can the Eucharist really be the center of everything that I think and that I do? And you start in chapter 9, Going back to culture again, the mm -hmm. Eucharist, the heart of culture. And again, it's that not just the heart of the mass, right? The heart of culture it starts there. And then to me, I, I love this line in the, the section, a life of festivity. The line mm -hmm. is, we underestimate the power of a meal. I think that relates to us on such a basic level that it's easy for us to ignore it and take it for granted. Uh, I know it is for me. <laughs> lunch is coming up, right? Oh, right. lunch comes up every day. But it can be so powerful. Yeah, and, and even the, 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 the term companion, you know, means someone with whom you break bread. Literally, that's what it means, right? And so I, I think that you know, really, if we're rooted in the Eucharist, that all of our eating and drinking should be different. 
and that, you know, the family meal becomes a kind of sacrament, lowercase s, right, of family life, that it is the ritual that sustains family and brings a deeper communion. But that's obviously true with friends, and that could even briefly bring us back to the beer option, right? I mean, sitting down for a meal or a beer or a glass of wine with a friend, it opens up conversation. It opens up a deeper communion with other people. And bringing that then into the Eucharistic sense of it is what you do here, and you do it uh, so well. For instance, the quote, the, the more we think about everything God has given us, the more joyful, thankful, and ready to celebrate we should be. It, it's such a, almost a light, light's probably not the right word, optimistic, uh, joyful way of, lo- of looking at things. Why do you celebrate? Because you're, you're happy about something and something is good. There's something worth celebrating. Well, we have those things, right? Why do we celebrate Christmas so much? And our culture's lost sight of that, but it's because something really good happened. Why do we celebrate Easter? Something really important, really good has happened. And, and I think part of Catholic culture eroding is that, yes, we go to Mass for these important occasions, but that celebration is meant to continue from the Mass. It's meant to flow from the Mass so that in the home, through our eating, our drinking, our time together, how we decorate our house, what we do together, that these things also express the joy that we have in our faith. Quote here, genuine celebration points to the unending feast in heaven is a fantastic line, and I've never thought, made that connection in my mind, but now I absolutely will, and you use the example of a toast. Like, what a, what a great example of, of joy. Like, who can't enjoy a toast? Yeah, that's right, and it's an affirmation of the goodness. So I'm going to toast to somebody. What am I saying? This person is good. I'm wishing them well. It's a kind of blessing, and traditionally, uh, it really was. I mean, prosit in Latin you know, which came Prost in German. It's like, may this thing be. It's a blessing. And every culture takes their own spin on it, right? You mentioned the Italian version and, yeah. and the whole way. It, it, it helps me really envision it and, and feel that joy so well with that example. Then you get into the, the rhythm of life. So mm-hmm. you start there with the heart of culture, the festivity, and get to the rhythm of life and Daily prayer starts that in in this section, and uh, I think it's uh, only uh, right that it would. I think that this is the most important element of living a Eucharistic culture, because if religion's the heart of culture, then I think for us it's prayer and worship, which is the heart of how we live as Christians, um, and th- and that needs to be every day, right? There there should not be a day that goes by without prayer. The Our Father was the kind of daily prayer. We talked about that before. Give us this day our daily bread. And so the Our Father is this prayer that shapes the day. But I would say if if we could all have 15 minutes of silent meditation and contemplation every single day, we're really giving a space for God to enter into our lives more fully. And that's just the beginning, right? You know, we can go to daily Mass plus this 15 minutes, which could become a half an hour once we get you know, more, more in the habit of it, right? And, and that really makes God to be the center of our day. God is then the center of our week through Sunday. And Sunday itself was always known as the Lord's day, not the Lord's hour, <laughs> the Lord's day. How, how can this be a day set apart for God and my family so that, so that everything I do this day is different? It's something special. It's something celebratory. It's something that is refreshing, that gives life, in which we enter into true leisure. Right? I, I think that that is the key point. And then, so you have your, the day, the week, but then also the year, um, that the, the life of Christ, which is celebrated in the liturgical seasons, um, should be what really gives us a rhythm to the entire year. So think of Advent, right? We're preparing for the Lord's coming. Um, You have Epiphany, and then, of course, the great season of Lent, which is a time of purification and renewal with Christ in the wilderness. Then you have even more days, 50 days, uh, to celebrate in in Easter. Um, And then, really, this time of the church uh, following Pentecost. So that should really be what grounds the family life and, 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 and my own prayer life throughout the entire year. The quote 
Alternating times of penance and rejoicing makes the story of salvation history come alive to us through the Mass and also shapes the rhythms of our family gatherings and celebrations. Uh, that sums it up perfectly in my mind because it can't always just be celebration and it shouldn't always be on the other end either. It's this right. rhythm that you, you speak of and I think you pointed out so beautifully. You also mentioned specific feast days and in this book, How the Eucharist Can Save Civilization, the specific ones centered around the Eucharist, like the Feast of Corpus Christi. And Corpus Christi, you know, was an octave, and there used to be, you know, uh, processions around the church in the neighborhood throughout the entire octave. Now, today, as, as, a, as a singular feast, this should really be a big deal, right? You know, setting up altars outside of the church, really making it a very big uh, day of processions for the entire parish. Um, this is an opportunity to bring the Eucharist out into the world and begin shaping even our own neighborhoods, you know, through um, our festivity. Hmm. Eucharistic miracles you mentioned you touch on here, and we'll get into that a little bit more. I wanted to move to chapter 11 that you entitled Making Space for Jesus, the Tabernacle of the World. And you start with architecture as a Eucharistic sign. Mm -hmm. That churches should look like churches, and that is that they should lead the mind and the senses upward to God. And I love this, even, you know, I just moved across the country. Right? And so as you're driving on the highway, you, 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 know, you pass a town or a city and you see those spires coming up. It is a reminder to pray. It's a reminder that Jesus is present within that church. And it really is a sign that God is here. God is present. You know, our culture may be secular, but you know what? He's still here. And that there is beauty in this world. There is a place for you to come to encounter God. I, I, I mean, I think this is really important. And so if we build beautiful churches, we have spires, domes, towers, all of these things, um, these will be a sacred sign uh, within our culture. I love how you point out that you look up to those. Right? Yeah. You're looking up. That's not a coincidence. Yeah, absolutely. In incredible. Eucharistic miracles. I mentioned you touched on that. You get into it here. Uh, so fascinating to me. Uh, we'll link it in this interview, the website from Blessed Carlo Acutis, who died at 15 but was so fascinated. He created a website that we can go to to check out all the Eucharistic miracles, more than 20 countries in the world, and it's right there just to point and click on for us here in the 21st century. Incredible. All the major continents, right? You can look in the Philippines and in India, right? There was a host with Eucharistic face, um, that happened recently in India. And so sometimes we think miracles. Oh, yeah, those are things that happened in the past, right? No, we have Eucharistic miracles happening now in Mexico, two in the last decade in Poland, or decade or so, right? I mean, so these are things that are happening right before our eyes. And what is happening with these miracles? Jesus is saying, I'm still here. Come back to me. They're an invitation, and so some of these people are like, yeah, like, I, I don't really believe that. But they have actually been tested scientifically. And so we are able to say, you know, especially you can see a lot of heart muscle tissue um, that is coming into a lot of the hosts. That's one particular form um, that these miracles take. And it is really fascinating. A couple of other general patterns in Eucharistic miracles besides the host turning into flesh, the host actually bleeds, the images appear on those hosts, and they miraculously resist decomposition or destruction. I, I feel like that one maybe sticks with me more than any other, mm -hmm. right? In a scientific, secular world where people are always looking to prove things or for evidence, like something that was supposed to go away never went away. And sometimes they're combined because there were right. some, some hosts um, that fell on the floor, and so there was a priest who wanted to decompose them in water, but instead they turned into flesh, right? And so there you have it resisting decomposition and miraculously turning into something else. Incredible. Let's move on to chapter 12. It's entitled Fostering Eucharistic Encounters, Honoring Christ's Body in the World. And the body as Eucharistic gift. The quote is, human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. We've all heard that. 
We all know that. But then applying it to how the Eucharist can save civilization is what you do here. Yes, because the Eucharist should help us to think of ourselves differently. That Paul, in 1 Corinthians, once again, he says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. But by receiving the Eucharist regularly, we literally are tabernacles. And so when we go out into the world, we should be shaped by the Eucharistic gift. We should think of ourselves differently. We should think of other people differently. That our bodies are related to Christ's body. That he gave himself as a gift on the cross, a gift to be consumed, literally consumed. Now what about us? Like when we go out into the world, how do we see other people? Do we see them as Christ? Or are we just thinking about ourselves? Right? Because Jesus did not come to think about himself. He came to think about the Father, and he came to think about those for whom he gave his life. Can we think about our lives in that same sense? Can we begin to see other people with the eyes of Christ? Because we're becoming Christ by receiving the Eucharist. Can we begin to see ourselves and our own bodies as a Eucharistic gift to be for other people? And, and this is where I make that connection to marriage as well, right? Because uh, if marriage is the two becoming one flesh, and we become one flesh with Christ, this is where, you know, quoting Archbishop Sheen, we can see, wait, there's three here in this marriage. I'm becoming, you know, one flesh with Christ. I'm also becoming one flesh with my wife and our union, and, and yet we are actually drawn together more deeply in our union by receiving the Eucharist together. Um, and I dedicated the book, actually, to my wife and to our shared Eucharistic life. That has always been the center. I met her in church, actually, and, you know, we, and we've always, you know, prayed together. We've had this kind of Eucharistic union. And, of course, the Eucharist is the center of our own family life. And that really should be the case, that our family should be centered in the Eucharist, should be for the Eucharist. Um, and the more that we're rooted in the Eucharist, the more that we do become for others. For those who don't have that backstory, I'm wondering if you have any ways to, to help move in that direction in a marriage specifically. Well, you know, if we say that religion is the heart of culture, we could say it's also the heart of marriage and family life as well. Um, and so I would say you know, for a couple that's not deeply rooted in, in the Eucharist, I would say, well, you know, obviously we're, we go to Mass together. Um, and that we're praying before Mass, even preparing for Mass together. We're praying after Mass together. But really, it's taking time every day together in prayer. Um, and so the, the rosary, you know, is a very important family prayer. Uh, and it's really opening ourselves to the mysteries of the faith. Um, praying Lexio Divina together, spending time in adoration together, because that's one of the key Eucharistic dispositions that we adore the Lord in the Eucharist when we go into a church or we go into the adoration chapel. And that should really foster um, the, this disposition of continual adoration that I'm focused on God. And when you think about it in marriage, if you both are fostering this disposition of adoration, that means we're looking together. We are looking to the Lord together, and if, and if seeing him enables us to see other things differently, that should enable us to see each other more deeply through the Lord. Mm, good advice, for sure. In this book, there are many instances of specific works, works of art, paintings, altarpieces that you point to to exemplify the, the massive impact at the time, how... Religion is really a, a massive factor, a massive factor on culture. Uh, Salvador Dali here in one of your last chapters, the Sacrament of the Last Supper, uh, the quote is: "The Eucharist truly encompasses the whole world in a mystical sense." That you are talking about it in that. Is there a favorite piece of art that you have in there um, that really helps apply what you are trying to convey in this book? You know, I really love Angra's. Um, uh, Our Lady's Adoration of the Host, um, because, you know, I just love that, that she has her hands folded um, and, and that she is adoring the Lord and kind of modeling the disposition that we should have um, in our own uh, devotion. So I just, and he did a few different versions of that. 
Um, and, and every time I see that, I'm just moved so deeply because I want to adore the Lord like Our Lady. And now it's it's up to us to pick up the pieces of civilization you have as one subtitle in there. And you mentioned Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> that, that's exactly where my mind goes to. Maybe it's my two-year-old, but picking up the pieces of civilization and how the Eucharist can help with that. You know, all the king's horses and all the king's men put couldn't put Humpty together again. And that's actually a sign of Adam. Literally, it is. Humpty Dumpty is meant to be us. We're humanity, that the pieces have all been broken. So the king's horses and his men, um, that's the, the, the kind of the angels and, and human beings, couldn't put it together. But who could? The king himself. The king comes into his own to set it right. Now, one of the things that, that I point out in this final chapter on you know, transforming civilization is that God ultimately doesn't care about civilization. I mean, literally, right? Jesus didn't say, I have come into the world to be a ruler and I'm going to create a perfect kingdom and everything is going to be right. Well, okay, he did. But what, what was the kingdom that he proclaimed? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. That is his kingdom. Now, there would be a temptation there to say, okay, yeah, the kingdom of heaven, that is just in heaven, right? That's not on earth. But no, we say that the kingdom of heaven is truly present on earth through the Eucharist, right? Because the king is there and he is coming with all of the solutions that we need, but they come to us by receiving the Eucharist. It's not like receive the Eucharist and then you know, you're going to know exactly what to do to fix all the world's problems. But this is the Lord's strategy. And this really is a strategy that we have to, to contemplate very deeply. I'm coming to you, and I want to fix you. And, and I want to fix your neighbor who's kneeling next to you in the pew, and your wife, and your kids, and your boss. You're, you're all here worshiping together. And I'm coming inside of you to make you into myself. And so when you go back home, you should be different in your family life. And when you go to work, you should be different. And if there's enough of you that I'm fixing from within, then you should really be able to make a difference in the world. I mean, it's actually a heresy to say that Christ doesn't want to fix the world. But we have to know how he wants to fix the world. He cares more about souls than about civilization. And by fixing souls, he will fix the world. And he's done it before. So once again, this is not hypothetical. We know how the Lord does this. How did he build up civilization in the West before? Through monasteries. People seeking God before all else. And when we seek God, we, we open a, a doorway to him. The more people who are devoted to the Eucharist and are giving their lives over to the Eucharist, we're opening a door to our own lives, to our families, to our work, and yes, to our civilization. That's not just throwaway. Like, you read this book because you wanted a blueprint for fixing civilization, and, and then at the end, I'm like, well, God doesn't really care about civilization. I'm sorry. No, that's not the <laughs> point of this. But the point is that, that really it is... The, you know, starting from the foundation, our, our civilization has worn down to the foundation. We need a proper foundation. And the Eucharist and, and our prayer, our encounter with Christ is that foundation. I mean, isn't that our faith? That without Christ, we can do nothing. That's what he tells us. But with him, we can do anything. We, we literally can. He says, you know, you will do greater things than these. What does that mean? Well, greater miracles than he performed during his life. You will do greater things than these. Do we have faith in that? Do we really believe that if we receive the Eucharist, we can do greater things than Christ did in his public ministry? So maybe we need greater faith first. And we need to get our lives in order. We need to get our family in order. We need to get our work in order. And this is a very important thing. We need to get our local communities in order. Because we tend to think like, well, you know, you know, we really, we just need to fix Western civilization as a whole. Or we just need to fix the church as a whole. Or we just need to fix our country. Or we need to fix this particular political party. No. Get your parish in order. Get your family in order. Get involved in local politics. Because I think we've seen the last few years, local politics can make a big impact. There are meaningful and impactful things that we can do 
And that's how God works. You know, first within what is right in front of us, not dropping solutions out of the sky. You know, he, he does do that occasionally. Joan of Arc is a good example of that. He can save a kingdom if he wants to. But ordinarily, he does it th through all these little pieces, right? We talk picking up the pieces of civilization. That's right. One piece at a time, and you are a piece, right, that he will be picking up as he is rebuilding for the future. And that leads to your conclusion. The, the Latin loosely translates to go the mass has ended. What's the phrase that you use? Uh, really, it's, it's go you are sent, right? You, you are being sent on a mission, the misa s. The word misa and mission are related etymologically. Now, ita misa s is somewhat mysterious. People say, well, we're not really sure how to translate that. But, you know, it really could be the sending of the gifts out to those who were sick and couldn't make mass. But, but it's also, it is a dismissal. But as you are being sent on a mission, I think that is very clear. Ite misa est. If you have encountered the Lord at this Mass, then you are being sent with that gift into the world. And how will God save civilization? It is through you. You are the plan. We as Catholics, there's over a billion Catholics in the world. You're telling me that we can't do something to save civilization? Of course we can. But it is getting our, our lives in order, getting the church in order, right? About being more focused on the Eucharist and more focused on God, even within the church, right? Ben, Pope Benedict said there is a secularism within the church, right? That we're not focused enough on the supernatural and, and what matters most. So uh, we say, what is God's plan for saving the world? It's us. That is, he came uh, into the world and he died for us on the cross, and he gathered his church around himself. That's what the word church means. It's kind of an assembly or gathering. He's gathered us together right now. What's God doing in the world? Where is God present in the world right now? In the community of the church. And, you know, it's too easy to think about the church as one organization amongst many. But that is not true. We're not a denomination. We're not just like a religious body. We are the mystical body of Christ in the world, and we are meant to permeate the whole. We are meant to be the soul of the world. We are meant to bring healing. We are meant to bring truth, to bring peace, to bring goodness, to bring beauty. Um, and we are meant to inspire people to, to really to evangelize them, to support them, to heal them, to gather people together, to work together, to cooperate um, even with people on the natural level, right? Just to say, we're going to work for just the goodness of marriage and family life with everyone who's willing to work together with us on that. We are going to, to uphold the dignity of human life because that is more and more countercultural. So how will the church rebuild civilization? It's recovering these goods that we are undermining in our culture. And so it is that we are going to have to be willing to die for the goodness of human life, that we have to be willing to die for the goodness of marriage and family life, that we're going to have to be willing to die for our Lord by putting him first. And that might literally be true, but even more mystically, it means that we're dying to ourselves to live for what matters most, that we're giving ourselves over to that completely so that he can live in and through us that Jesus will save civilization, that he will save this world by living in the members of his body and acting through them in the world. Well, I think it's a perfect conclusion because we talked about it at the beginning. Jesus came on a rescue mission, mm -hmm. and now our mission is to go out and to help save this civilization through him and the Eucharist. One soul at a time. It's great stuff. A great way to end today. Really appreciate your time. I really appreciate the book, How the Eucharist Can Save Civilization. Dr. Jared Stout. Thank you.